Here we are at the airport, waiting for our flight. First to Istanbul, and then to Egypt. So that's why we're flying with Turkish Airlines, which has absolutely fantastic meals, by the way. I really savored every bite during the 11-hour flight. And between naps, I enjoy checking the status of the flight as we passed over Europe. Our layover is eight hours long, but the time flies by as we explore the enormous and magnificent Istanbul Airport, exploring each concourse and an exhibit about Muslim scientists and pioneers of technology. And the airport also has its own museum, which showcases uh, Turkish treasures from all across history. Before long, it's time to take off once again, though. Now to Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. And it's around 2 a.m. in the morning as we fly over Cairo. I had my eyes glued to the window, wondering if I could somehow see the pyramids in the dark. But alas, only the glowing streets below were visible. Before we know it, we're already landing in Egypt. Our plane touches down smoothly and quietly, and our passage through customs is uneventful, thankfully. We arrive to our apartment complex so late after the bright glow of the full moon, and right away, we're greeted by new friends. Fuzzy, fluffy cow dog trots up to us for some pets and follows and leads us to our building. After we store our luggage, this cutie ginger girl joins the welcome wagon and leads us up to the roof of our building. we can see a glimpse of the area's beautiful night skyline and the bright shining stars above. She also makes sure to aggressively snuggle our legs before we return to our apartment and fall into a very welcome deep sleep after such a long travel day. The next morning, we decide to do some light adventurizing to become acclimated to the area. So we take this mysterious path in search of a beach access and we can smell the sea so we're nowhere close. Moments later, we're on the coast of the Red Sea at the entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba. This beach is so shallow that walking deep onto the pier, we can still see the sandy bottom easily. Little fish swimming and abundant growths of seaweed. Fresh, cool air blows in, and even though we're in Egypt, some days in the winter can be a bit too chilly for swimming. But wading through this shallow beach, we can see little creatures, like tons of brittle stars using their arms to scavenge algae other organic particles. And then I saw this little crab running along the bottom. So I follow him until he find a little hiding spot blending into the sand. Last year, I got my scuba diving license and one of my instructors from Poland heavily recommended Egypt for scuba diving. So I'm so excited to dive here since he told me that the Red Sea has some of the most beautiful coral reefs in the world. So we take a yacht out to a diving location and dive down. The water is so clear and blue, and the sunlight flickers through the waves, illuminating the coral and the fish. We're surrounded everywhere by a jewel fairy basilisk. Those are these bright orange fish, the orange ones are the females, and then the 
pink ones are the males. And we can also see what looks like to be Indo-Pacific surgeon fish. Those are the ones with the vertical stripes on the top right there. When we turn away from the reefs, we see groupings of Suez facilia fish. I really hope I'm identifying these fish correctly. And then I saw what I think is a moon jellyfish. Before we swim back to our boat, it was a short dive, but there was so much eye candy that I really never forget. Unfortunately, after all of the fun excursions, I got a little bit sick. I had a cough and a fever for a few days and had to spend some time relaxing at home, focusing on the basics, like making coffee in this new way I never did before which actually I don't think I was doing correctly because I even would drink the coffee grounds at the end of it. <laughs> Being in Egypt for a month made me reflect a lot and realize how I don't truly need as many things as I thought I did. I spent a lot of time thinking and enjoying the things around me rather than seeking out new things all the time. Even common everyday occurrences are adventurism and enjoyable, which is also part of being in a foreign country. Everything feels new, like you're, like you're a child again a little bit. After feeling better, it was time to spend a day exploring the area. Sharm el Sheikh is a very touristic city, so there's a lot of cool things to see. And when we leave the apartment, we're always surrounded by ginger kitties. Their daily antics are so funny every day. Get a little boost to look over the wall at the behind the scenes of the big resorts here on our way to a small market. A big group of small shops selling oils, hats, and other souvenirs. But my favorite shopkeeper is this future mommy ginger kitty. And also this little currency exchange guardian, making sure no shenanigans are happening. After that, we jump on one of the blue buses to visit the most essential destination in a foreign country. McDonald's. Though I'll admit, I'm a little bit disappointed I can't order a McFalafel at this location. But we enjoy a McRoyal and a Big Mac. And actually, the McRoyal kind of tastes like a Burger King Whopper. After our nutritious lunch, we walk up some steps to get a view of Nama Bay, surrounded by Sinai Desert Mountains. And behind us is a half-abandoned shopping mall a casualty of the pandemic or the unfortunate terrorist attacks the city has suffered in the past, but I enjoy being in a peaceful empty building, almost in awe of it, honestly. And after we explore the mall, we step out to witness a magical sunset. I feel like I'm looking at heaven for a moment. And then we head to Soho Square and have a little caffeine boost with tea, enjoy the beautiful light displays before going to the coolest bar I've ever seen, Varsha Mountain Lounge. It's like being in an ancient magical bazaar from Aladdin. It's such a great way to end an amazing day in Sharm el Sheikh venture our way back to our apartment, counting a pack of street dogs on the way. At 
It's quiet here, though. Mostly everyone seems to have turned in for the night. Except for maybe some of our furry friends, including one of our favorite best friends, Ginger Mommy. She's so sweet. She always has so much love to give. Also, our big, fluffy cow dog guardian, protecting us from the dark shadows. Good night, Shamal Sheik. And Cairo, here we come. We pack some snacks for our journey, which starts at midnight. Peanuts, chips, apples, and bananas. And we board the bus for our overnight journey through the Sinai Desert. The drone of the bus is soothing as we nod in and out of sleep. Our bus traveling in a convoy of other buses with actually a police escort because of the current dangers of traveling through Sinai. We end up passing through several police checkpoints along the way and sometimes they even stop us to check the bottom luggage compartment of our bus. But Usually, we just slowly pass through these small desert rest stops. And early morning, we arrive in Cairo and watch out the windows of the plethora of tan-colored apartment high-rises. I'd never seen so many before passing through this city. Our first stop is the Egyptian Museum, which is a beautiful coral-colored neoclassical building. It's a crowded day, and many other tourist buses are arriving along with us. The inside is beautiful, and the archaeological collections are extensive and fascinating. Like this, bilingual slab like the Rosetta Stone, called the Cannabis Decree, and numerous sarcophagi. This one is made of granite. And this, a false door, which Egyptians believed allowed the soul of the deceased to pass through. A statue of Hafre, who built the second largest pyramid, Giza, and perhaps the Sphinx. We are fascinated by so many artifacts, including this golden child mummy. And this golden funeral death mask created to help the dead recognize their body in the afterlife. There are also many unmarked wooden coffins with painted scenes on display. And also large stone sarcophagi. No mummies inside anymore though. I check inside a lot of them to make sure. This is the goddess Sirkat, who could cure venomous bites and stings. And ending our exploration of the Egyptian museum are the giant sculptures of Pharaoh Amenhotep and his wife Tia. We reboard the bus and drive along through Giza before boarding a small vessel to cruise the Nile River, the longest river in Africa and possibly the world even, it's debated, and the foundation of ancient Egyptian society. The land around the Nile was very fertile due to annual flooding which deposited silt and rich deposits on the banks for successful farming. This led to the creation of valuable industry and generated trade for ancient Egypt. In modern times, the Nile is used to transport goods and its banks are still the residence of most Egyptians. Farming still takes place today. However, the rich fertile inundation which once occurred was halted by the building of the Aswan Dam. At the same time, 
The dam has protected Nile residents from flooding as well as droughts, leading to more consistent agricultural practices, not prey to the whims of the god Hape, who controlled the annual flood in ancient Egypt. We continue our journey through Cairo and catch glimpses of something amazing in the distance. I can't tell you how excited I am just seeing the ancient pyramids standing proudly among modern buildings and cars. I'm imagining what the landscape looked like over 4,000 years ago when they were built. The tallest structures in the world for thousands of years. The Great Pyramid of Giza specifically, built for the pharaoh Hufu as his final resting place. And its neighbor, the Pyramid of Hafre, built for the pharaoh that same name. What's curious is neither Hafre or Hufu's mummies have been found. Only empty burial chambers thought to be built for them. Whether they ever were actually buried in the pyramids or their mummies were stolen long ago, we may never know. Next to Hafre's pyramid is the much smaller period of Mankare and the even smaller Queen's pyramids. All six pyramid sides are aligned nearly perfectly with the cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. Millions of people visit the pyramids every year to get a marvel of the only wonder of the ancient world that's still standing today. And it truly is a marvel. There's no words to describe our feeling of wonderment here. It's fitting that the area is surrounded by dogs, the patron animal of Anubis, the god of funerals, and the protector of graves. But honestly, okay, I just have to take a video of cute puppies. And this is their mama. After the pyramids, we take a very short journey to see the Great Sphinx which is only about 500 meters away from the pyramids. The Sphinx is attributed to King Hafre due to the potential facial similarity between the two. And after passing through some stone chambers and walkways, we're able to view the Sphinx from a distance. It's a lot more protected due to past degradation and violation it has endured, unfortunately. A missing nose and possibly a missing beard still doesn't completely mar the beauty of the structure. Part man, part lion, it faces east at the rising sun. We follow a train of camels back to our bus. It has been a long and unforgettable day and we're ready for a bit of a rest. On our way back, we pass under the Suez Canal which connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and our journey descends back into the night. We're sleepy and ready to sink into the comfort of our seats as we travel under the cool, dark desert sky, listening to the reliable drone of our bus carrying us safely back.